Executive Director of the United Palestinian Appeal since 2011. United Palestinian Appeal, also sometimes just abbreviated by UPA, uh, is registered as a 501c3 nonprofit, nonpolitical, and non-religious organization. Those are IRS terms you probably already know. Um, with headquarters in Washington, D.C., and activities in Palestine, Jordan, and Lebanon. UPA strives to contribute to the long-term socioeconomic and cultural development of Palestinian communities, particularly in the West Bank, Gaza, and the Palestinian refugee camps in the Middle East. UPA's areas of focus are healthcare, education, and community and economic development. Let's welcome Salim Zaru. Thank you, Tom. Uh, is this? It's can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you for this gracious introduction. Uh, had I known you were going to be so kind, I would have showed up at 6 in the morning. Uh, louder, OK. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to thank you for inviting me and for sharing your time with me today. I also would uh, like to add that uh, I want to thank my friend Kirk Campbell, who should have been here today uh, talking about a group affiliated somewhat with the United Palestinian Appeal that he started back in 2008. The name of the group is Ikra, which means read in Arabic. What this group does is runs marathons, a group of runners and non-runners who are trained to become runners or walkers <laughs> uh, in these marathons that raise funds for Palestinian education. So their, their logo or their tagline is run for a brighter Palestine. Uh, the, Lab the Lebanese American Philosopher, writer, and poet Khalil Gibran, Gibran, Khalil Gibran, said once or wrote in his book, The Prophet, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, it is when you give of yourself, not your possessions, that you are truly giving. Kirk and his group are doing just that today. They are running in one of the marathons to raise funds for university scholarships. So before we start, I would like to pass this. And if you like to uh, sign up to get uh, updates about Kirk, what he's doing and his group, or what UPA is doing, I would just pass it along and feel free to sign up. You could get uh, electronic or regular mail, whatever you want. And if you don't want to sign up, just pass it down. <laughs> so uh, Kirk is uh, running right now. And uh, we cheer Kirk and his group. And let's give him a hand. Thank you. Now, I know we're on the clock. And I'm going to try and keep it to the time we have. So I would make it brief. UPA was uh, established in 1978 by a group of Palestinian American businessmen and professionals. And the reason for that was not the lack of organizations that helped support the Palestinians in those days, but the lack of non-political organizations. Uh, in those days, every political faction outside the West Bank and Gaza was helping or was trying to, to exert some influence in the occupied territories by supporting somebody, by controlling people with, with giving money. And the founders of UPA wanted a non-political, strictly humanitarian organization 
that would support the Palestinian people without any political strings attached. Over the last 39 years, UPA has existed for 39 years, uh, UPA has maintained its independence. Uh, no affiliation with any political groups, no political uh, uh, interest whatsoever, strictly humanitarian. And that has been part of our credibility and uh, just who we are. Uh, I remember before my time, uh, one time UPA received a check for a million dollars a donation for a million dollars. Uh, in a week, the board found out that this was from an individual, but actually it came from one of the political groups in Lebanon. So the check was immediately given back, mm -hmm. and they said UPA is not for sale. Mm -hmm. So UPA works in four major sectors. And I have a couple of short uh, videos that I will share with you, but briefly. UPA works in health and wellness. We have programs uh, in that uh, field. Works in education, and it goes from university education, uh, continuing education, vocational training, uh, kindergarten education, everything and community and economic development. And this is an important part because historically, organizations like UPA are thought of as charities. And when I came to UPA, they were telling me this is one of the, this is the oldest Palestinian American charity. This is one of the most credible charities. I didn't know anything about UPA when I joined, mm -hmm. when I was asked to, to join the organization. And I didn't like this term, charity. I just did not like it. I think uh, the way we tend to do charity is uh, just by definition, there is a recipient and there is a donor or a giver. And, and by the nature of this relationship, it is not on equal basis. So there is a lot of compromise of integrity when we give and when we receive. So I said, let's not refer to this as, as a charity. Charity has, in my mind, uh, I grew up in Palestine and I've seen people come and go and people give and do this and that. Let's not think of it as that. There is a lot of uh, colonial mentality in charity and let's stay away from that. And they said, that's fine. Call it whatever you want. You have a free hand. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to, to, because time is so limited, I, I, I want to give you as much time to ask questions. I would like to uh, show you uh, two short videos, one about UPA in general, and one about one of our most important programs, what I think is one of our most important programs. And I will start with the first one and then maybe we'll talk about it a little bit and then we go to the other one. Hospital 
on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. UK partners with grassroots Palestinian organizations in crisis situations, ensuring that needs of individuals and small communities are met in the most efficient way. Emergency funds for food, water, and other items were made available within days of the onset of the Operation Cast Lead in 2009 and again during the massive floods in Gaza in 2013. Due to the political conflict in Syria, thousands of Palestinians fled to take refuge in Jordan. UPA responded immediately and extended emergency relief to help meet their basic needs. Children's Fund works to foster a nurturing and stimulating environment for children that allows them to realize their full potential. UPA أجت ودعمت هذا المشروع اللي هو تعزيز التعلم النشط المقدم للطفل وبناء عليه صار تغيير جذري من قبل نحكي بهذا بهذا الأساس كان الفيدباك من الطفل إنه كثير إشي حلو إنه الطفل عم بنفسه إنه صار بغير بيقدر إنه الصبح يركز بعد الظهر يلعب بيطلع بيستمتع بالرمل إنه هذا الإشي كان انعكس على الطفل من الناحية الإيجابية. The Children's Fund supports projects that serve children who are disabled, impoverished, or orphaned. UPA implements the projects by partnering with reputable Palestinian schools, orphanages, and social service agencies. قديمة جدا فيما يتعلق بمساعدة اليوبي اي للاطفال يعني وجود الباص كثير مهم ومساعدة اليوبي اي في هذا المجال كمان كثير مهم لانه تعطيهم الفرصة انهم يلتحقوا بالمدارس التي تعطي افراد الاسرة الاخرين. مؤسسة اليوبي اي تقدم خدماتها لهذه المدرسة من خلال تبني بعض الأفراد الصوم منذ سنوات طويلة هذا ساهم وساعد في استمرارية المدرسة واستمرارية خدماتها وجودة الخدمات في مدرسة الأطفال المنحة كانت المقدمة من اليو بي اي بحدود حوالي 98 ألف دولار طبعا المشروع هو بيدف إلى إنهاء كل الطابق المخصص للأطفال في فرجة المكتبة UPA seeks to buttress Palestinian higher education and encourage the development of an independent, sustainable Palestinian economy. Since 1986, UPA's scholarship program has helped over 2,000 Palestinian students realize their dream of higher education. Each scholarship covers a large portion of a student's tuition costs and continues throughout the duration of their degree. <laughs> إن شاء الله يا رب تساعدني أكثر. السنة ال 87 تواصلت مع اليو بي اي دعمهم بلش السنة الثانية بالجامعة الأردنية في أثناء دراسة البكالوريوس ساعدت إنه أستمر في بعض السنوات. شوقي أبو شاب أدرس في جامعة فلسطين حصلت على منحة في كلية طب وجراحة سم وأسنان حصلت على منحة من مؤسسة النداء الفلسطيني الموحد الكلية الجامعية بدأت علاقة مميزة مع يو بي اي منذ عدة سنوات بهدف توفير وصول الطلبة وخلال السنوات الماضية استفاد عدد كبير من الطلبة في مختلف المجالات The unemployment rate in Palestine is more than 20%. In the Gaza Strip, where the Israeli blockade has led to the collapse of the local economy, the unemployment rate is 41%. UPA's community development projects help to address this problem by generating jobs and increasing the income of the most impoverished.
نحن استفدنا من اليو بي اي ضمن برنامج التشغيل الطارئ مشروع استكمال وتشطيب اللي هو طابق الجروب كلفة المشروع كانت بقيمة 54 ألف دولار The UPA Food Program works to combat hunger and malnutrition among Palestinians by providing meals to children at their school or other caregiving institution, distributing food parcels to impoverished families, and supporting sustainable agriculture projects, including community gardens that add needed calories and nutrients to a family's diet. <laughs> مساعدة نداء الفلسطيني الموحد كانت كثير مهمة للأطفال والطلاب في المدرسة لأن حسن وضعهم الصحي من خلال تقديم هذه الوجبات وتحسين وضعهم الصحي ساعد على تحسين أدائهم الدراسي والأكاديمي. <تصفيق> This uh, video is about uh, maybe five years old. It is not Hollywood. <laughs> it's very simple production put together. The reason I like to use it and show it, it was put together by two uh, recipients of our scholarships after they graduated, one from Gaza, one from the West Bank. Uh, they put it together as a token of their appreciation to UPA. So that's why I like to show it. So uh, over time, uh, UPA's business model has changed a little bit. Uh, typically, what UPA did in the past is fund local organizations to do their lo local projects and run them. And uh, several years ago, we did an evaluation of our projects, uh, I think back in 2011. We, we evaluated, we hired an external evaluator uh, to look at projects that we did in the last, or, or funded, not we did, for the last 10 years. And we looked at projects that other similar organizations have funded for the last 10 years. And it was unfortunate for us to realize that once the funding stops, the project stops. The sustainability of these projects uh, was very questionable, was very shaky. And that's the nature of this business in a lot of cases. But that's when we started thinking strategically about what are we going to do about changing that. And uh, I had a personal experience with something that became a major project that we're doing here, or major program. Back when I was still living in Ramallah and had a major construction company, I was in Maryland one day and I met a gentleman and his wife that became very good friends of mine. His name is Bill McGee and his wife's name is Kathy. And they are the founders of Operation Smile. And they do cleft lip and palate surgeries all over the world. And. Uh, and he was telling me, and he had this book in his pocket showing me pictures of kids before and after and all that. 
And I said, where do you do these? And he was telling me, you know, South America and this and that. I said, how about uh, the West Bank and Gaza? Do we need this? Do, we, do you know that uh, there are? He said, oh, you need it, all right. <laughs> I said, would you come there? And uh, he said, we don't have the funding. And I said, how much does it take? He said, every mission costs $30,000, and we could operate on maybe uh, 100 kids in a week. And I said, that's great. When can you come? And he said, as soon as the funding is available. And I talked to my partner then, and I said, let's fund two delegations. That's my term. Missions, their term. <laughs> uh, one in the West Bank and one in Gaza. And my naive understanding of what they're doing, I thought this operation this initial operation is all these kids need. So you see the before and after. You, kid goes into this operation, you know, half an hour later he comes out. It's, it's life changing. And little did I know that this is the tip of the iceberg. And after doing these two missions in the West Bank and Gaza, we advertised this. Our company's name was Shahrazad Homes. <laughs> and we advertised, Shahrazad gives back to the community. Shahrazad is supporting me this and that, and we marketed it so bad. And these guys came. A week later, they were gone, but we were there. And there has not been one week where we get a parent with a child come to the office, and they say, the kid cannot drink his milk. The kid cannot eat. The kid needs something, you know, some follow-up or whatever. And I called my friend Bill and I said, you know, what do we do here? And he said, we're out of here. We're we did what we needed to do. Everything else falls on the local doctors, which these doctors didn't have the expertise to do anything. When I started with UPA, we did an extensive research on children that are born in Palestine with a cleft left lip and palate, and we found out that there are 12,000 people, 12,000 kids that have not been operated on or have been operated on inadequately. And there are about four to 500 kids that are born every year with this problem. So we started a program, not of operating on kids, but of training surgeons. This program has been ongoing for four years now. We have three surgeons, or, or five surgeons, that are trained in Palestine. We built a training center. We had a an agreement with the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center to give us trainers, experts. And we take them there, they spend two weeks at a time, and they train these <coughs> surgeons, they train orthodontics, they train uh, orthodontists, they train uh, uh, speech and language therapists, because these are, the, all these disciplines have to come together to give these children a comprehensive uh, treatment. And this year, we are starting, this center was in the West Bank. Now we are taking this program to Gaza. Next year, we will take it to southern Lebanon in Saida to train physicians in the Palestinian refugee camps there, and the following year to Jordan. This has become a regional program of trained physicians and other medical personnel. And this is not charity. This is beyond charity. This is a sustainable solution. Another one that is similar to this is mental health 
care for children who are suffering from ongoing trauma. And I'll show you a short video, then we can talk about it. On. Okay, I, um, I thought I would ask the first question and then we'll open it up to the house to ask questions. Oh, Salim, within the context of the West Bank and Gaza and the military occupation, can you talk some about the economics of, uh, for instance, where the graduates go for jobs and sure. the problem of movement? within the West Bank, going to and from Jerusalem, for example, right, right. or traveling from Gaza to Jerusalem? Right. Yeah. Uh, the, the restriction on movement of people and goods is one of the most devastating restrictions on the Palestinian economy, let alone the uh, lack of uh, access to uh, resources such as water and land and everything else. Uh, somebody once asked me, uh, what is the difference between the West Bank and Gaza? And I said, Gaza is a huge prison. The West Bank is a number of smaller prisons. Because if you're in Ramallah, you could have a little bit of freedom within you know, a three mile radius or a two mile radius or whatever it is. 
But if you want to go to Nablus, uh, it is such a big challenge with going through uh, checkpoints, settlements, restricted streets. Some streets you cannot drive on because this is, these streets are specified for uh, uh, Israeli settlers. You have to go around. One of the reasons I stopped teaching back in 91 is exactly that. I couldn't get to school anymore. I was living in Ramallah. I was teaching at the University of Nablus. And getting there was just next to impossible. So uh, this, is, this is a major problem, movement. Uh, the economy is, the Palestinian economy pre-1967 was, uh, the, the basic economic unit was an agricultural village that was poor in terms of cash flow but was uh, uh, sustainable. People had enough to eat. They didn't have a lot of cash. But after 1967, with having access to uh, labor opportunities in Israeli uh, factories, a lot of farmers left the land and went to uh, work for, for some, one of these factories and that shifted the economy from an agrarian one to a cash economy. At the end of the week, these guys got a check. But what that did is killed the Palestinian economy and made it very much dependent on the Israeli economy. So whenever there's a closure and these people can't go and work in the factory, that's it. So some of our programs that we focus on is are, are focusing on agriculture to try and revitalize some kind of a Palestinian economy. Uh, the resources we have there are land and water, a lot of which we don't have access to, and the human resource. We don't have uh, gas, we don't have uh, oil, we don't have minerals, we don't have anything. So it's people and land, and we try to uh, cultivate hope so people could understand or, or realize that they could survive within the circumstances. So I don't know if that answers, yes. yeah. How about if we open it up to the house and take a first question? Uh, I'm curious, I couldn't hear every word you were speaking, because you're... Uh, you didn't miss much. <laughs> I didn't miss <laughs> I, I know, I get your notifications all the time. Uh, how many students receive scholarships? Uh, I need the volume of your of work. Of course, of course. Uh, yes. Since the beginning of a scholarship program, 29 years ago, over 2,500 students have benefited from the scholarship program in, in a number of Palestinian universities. 2,500, over 2,500. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, uh, go uh, ahead, and yeah, then we'll get, I, we'll get the I, mic. I got here. the mic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I believe I've read that there's a, uh, a strong tradition of higher education in Palestinian culture. Yes. And, and you've mentioned the, um, the program to train doctors and nurses and medical people. I'm wondering, uh, is there an issue with trained medical uh, professionals not staying long enough, or are they staying in Palestine long enough to, to give a stable um, support there? Right, right. Uh, that's actually, that's a very good question. Human beings, by nature, uh, look for better opportunity. Uh, and uh, probably that's one of the reasons I'm here, <laughs> better opportunity. Uh, but uh, our training programs are focused on, when we talk about doctors and medical personnel, these are people that are in Palestine, and these are people that don't have the opportunity to go and train elsewhere. 
the reason we built a training center is because we couldn't bring him to Cincinnati or to Chicago or somewhere else. Uh, we brought them to we we brought the training to them, and so these are the people that are staying. Now you got to realize that a lot of people are stuck there. Not everybody is lucky enough to have an opportunity to leave seeking a better life. So that's uh, a lot of people we work with are there and there to stay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, my question really goes to those who are not in the professional fields and how you're trying to deal with the youth unemployment at the sort of lower strata. Yeah, People yeah. who may not be able to go to university but still need jobs. Absolutely, there. absolutely. Thank you. That, that's a great question here. Uh, this uh, is a major program that we have. It is the Small Business Development Program. And what we do is uh, we seek the youth, people who have graduated from high school and can't find a job or have gotten uh, has some kind of vocational training or something. In fact, we tap into our scholarship recipients that have graduated and don't find a job. So what we do is we put them through a three-week small business training program to, to understand how to run a small business, what a financial statement looks like. Very basic stuff, very basic. And then we give them a grant to start a business. Uh, actually, the, the last thing of their small business training, they have to write a little proposal of what they want to do. And we select these proposals and we study them and the ones we see are going to be sustainable. We fund them with a small grant and a small loan. Now the loan costs us more to administer than, than the money that we're going to get back. But that is very important for a young man to realize and understand that he is earning a business. He's not handed over a business. He's not, he's earning it. And that's the idea of integrity and not compromising integrity with, you know, with charity. So it's not given to him, but he's earning it. And we're talking about the $500 loan, you know, it's not, it's not but so far, we've been doing this for several years, maybe six years now. So far, the default rate is zero. And we have started this a few years ago for female heads of households. And again, the default rate is zero. And these people start making uh, $20 a day. But you could see the hope they have and the self-worth they have after not being able to support their family or their extended family or their, you know. But this is, this is an amazing uh, program. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there and say, please. Um, mine's more of two comments about things that have already been said. Okay. Uh, one is that one of the things that I've one of the things that I found uh, amazing was that Google Maps, you know, we all use GPS. You can use GPS on one side when you're in Israel. Right. But you can't use Google Maps to do anything behind the, the wall. That is correct. And that is because internet access. So I have my phone. I go to the West Bank or Gaza. I don't have 3G or 4G or 1G or any kind of G. <laughs> so it is forbidden to have that uh, in the West Bank. So not only Google Maps, but uh, you can make a call, you know. So that's one of the restrictions. That's one of the living under the occupation. That's what it means, you know. Don't you have a website that we can read regularly? Uh, we do have a website. We, I, will, I will share it with you. I'm going to give you some information here. Yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. I'm trying to get an idea of the scale of your work. Do you have numbers or do you have a slide that shows uh, your budget for some recent year 
and the s different sectors that you work in and how many entities you have affected in that sure, year? Sure, sure. Uh, what I did, because of the time limitation, I brought some uh, annual reports here from last year. Uh, it shows our budget, it shows our overheads, it shows one thing here that I would point out now, and feel free to take some of these, that I'm proud of is our overheads is less than 3%. This is unheard of. Uh, and uh, our rating, as uh, presented by uh, Charity Navigator, which is a third party that rates charities in the United States, uh, is a four-star charity, which is the highest rating you can get for transparency, accountability, and financial stability. And I'm proud to say that. So, uh, but that's all in that book. And it talks about the percentages of, uh, you know, the, 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 our budget, what goes to health care, what goes to this and that. Uh, our budget, I might add, uh, six years ago was about a half a million dollars. Last year it was over 16 million. And m more than 97% of that goes to programs. Take one quick question and then we'll have to wrap up because of the time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to thank you, first of all, for coming. It's been fantastic to learn about the work that you're doing. Thank you and it's impressive on every front, Thanks. just incredible. Uh, so my final question, I guess, is what do you need? What does your organization most need to continue your work and to expand your mission? Well, thank you for asking that. You want the short list or the long one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need two things. We need all the support we can get, whether it's financial and otherwise, and we need all the criticism we can get so we can be held accountable and keep improving. So if you see something that you think, oh, that doesn't make sense, pick up the phone. I'm going to give you my card, and I'm going to expect a call from you. Here. You're welcome. Salim, thank you so much for being with us today. That's a pleasure. Thank you. And if... Uh, we know that most, most people have to go on to the next worship service, but if you would like to stay and talk a few minutes with Celine. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to uh, stay for a while.